When you described this slow and gradual shift mm. in the cell as mm. it moves to this sort of ancient system, mm. it sounded very gradual. So in my head, I thought, okay, so does that mean that the cr cancer is a gradual process that is kind of building up in me or isn't building up in me based on the lifestyle decisions I'm making and my environmental factors right now? It, it, like I'm trying to say, does, is, does cancer start slowly? Years um, before you, you, you know, you find yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it is a gradual process, but it can be impacted by several provocative agents from the from the microenvironment. Um, lack of exercise. Okay, so we're not exercising nearly as much as our Paleolithic ancestors, bar none. Right? We have massive amounts of processed carbs in our diets. We have a lot of emotional stress, uh, um, mental emotional stress that's impacting negatively on, on our biology. Um, we, we have lack of sleep. Sleep, uh, a lot of us, because we, we have stresses. You, you have to have, when you put all of these impactful things together in one person, you can put yourself at risk for cancer, all of which will damage and reduce the efficiency of, of mitochondria. And also, uh, the joy of living, uh, having friends and friendships and, and this kind of thing, reduces stress in a lot of different ways, makes people enjoy getting up and, and having a, a nice day rather than being depressed or, or these kinds of things. Um, you put all, all this together and you put yourself in a, a diet and a lifestyle that puts you at risk for damage to oxidative phosphorylation and the transition from one form of energy to a fermentation energy. And what I'm trying to understand, is that a... It's a gradual, gradual, a gradual transition. You have to be able to do that. And how long does it take for a colon, a, a, a group of cells in a, in, a, in a crypt of your colon to transition from one stage to another? You have to be constantly under stress, those cells and that organ. Now, why somebody gets colon cancer, another person gets breast cancer, another person gets bladder cancer, and some person gets a brain cancer and all these different kinds of cancers? Whatever, whatever happened, the process was, dis, was causing a gradual disruption of oxidative phosphorylation, oxidative respiration, and a, and a gradual transition to a fermentation. Like in the brain, the neurons rarely, if ever, get cancer, but the glial cells that support neurons, they are usually the source of the origin of cancer in the brain for those kinds of cells. And you can look at different cells, and some are more or less prone. And why this guy get lung cancer from, from smoking cigarettes? This guy got bladder cancer from smoking cigarettes. How did it all start? It all started from a population of cells in one of those organs having an, a chronic, not instant, a chronic interruption of oxidative energy followed by an upregulation of this fermentation energy. So really we need to be thinking about all the things that have caused dysfunction in the mitochondria. Absolutely. I want to get a list of the key things that are associated uh, with causing this dysfunction. Okay, carcinogens. Okay, so carcinogens. Yeah, so and you know, smoking. there's many asbestos, there's all kinds of chemicals in the environment. You hear about this, oh, there's a whole list of carcinogens. We, and they put them on the, on the labels on different chemicals. They say carcinogenic potential and whatever you have. What are the types of things that are carcin carcinogenic that most people don't realize? Oh, well, now we're talking about microplastics. We're talking about... Um, is that in part what causes breast cancer? Because I always think about deodorant with breast cancer and, and the stuff that we're kind of oh, lathering onto our yeah, arms. Yeah, well, the, the one that was, was most interesting was the talcum powder one. How does talcum powder would cause ovarian cancer? Okay, it's taken up into the urogenital tract, and it forms a foci in, in a part of the ovarian tissue. What's a foci? Uh, a locus, uh, like a collection of material. A, a foci is, a, is a, 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 an area where say, talcum materials would be accumulating. Mm -hmm. And that leads to an inflammatory um, area of the body. And our immune system comes in to see what's going on. Our immune system is a healing machine. And they see something that's not, not normal. Normally, they would clean it up. But they throw uh, cytokines and growth factors on there, leading to dysregulate damage to mitochondria and dysregulate us. And then you get this tumor that starts. So if I get a talcum powder uh, granule or whatever, and it goes into my body, my body then tries to attack it to, to sort it out. And in doing so, it creates inflammation, yeah. which leads to- Damage to mitochondria in a particular group of cells near that foci. Okay, and okay. This, this is applicable to, I guess, a lot of different nanoparticles. Yeah, and, yeah. and microplastics are this now, they're looking at this. But then we have chemical carcinogens, tetrahydrochloride, there's all kinds of other things that can actually damage. 
uh, arsenics and, and these kinds of chemicals, um, urethane, uh, anything that could chronically damage uh, a mitochondrion, forcing over time, forcing it to upregulate the fermentation, the energy without oxygen. Isn't this most things? Huh? I'm trying to figure out what I, how to live my life. Yeah, well, that's, what that, that's why it was called the oncogenic paradox. But, but you, can, you can avoid that. That's why I'm saying if you can keep your mitochondria healthy. How? Exercise and reduce uh, consumption of highly processed carbohydrates. Do I need to be avoiding these microplastics as well? You, you know, the problem with microplastics, they're very ubiquitous. We're not really sure. Uh, we're just now becoming aware of it. Nobody really knew that before. Um, yeah, look it up. It's, but it could, it could cause uh, small foci in different populations of cells. But, you know, it's very hard to really chronically damage mitochondria. Mitochondria are a tough organelle. The problem is we chronically abuse it without realizing what we need to do to keep it healthy. So even if you are exposed to chemical carcinogens, even if you are exposed to all these things, but you're keeping your body as healthy as you possibly can, you could possibly delay or even prevent the damage to the mitochondria, even though you have the, even though you are being exposed to this. So it's, a, it's actually in your hands. Um, you can actually reduce risk for cancer by knowing what keeps your mitochondria healthy. Vigorous exercise, uh, fasting, water-only fasting. Um, you know, it's very hard. Some, but sometimes we, when we were putting mice on calorie restriction, it was hard to get them to have, get tumors. <laughs> Their body was so healthy. This was shown years ago by, by a couple of scientists in mice uh, using mice with, that developed a lot of breast cancer. If you put them on a calorie-restricted diet, the incidence was way, way down. So you, cancer is very preventable. It's a very preventable uh, disorder. It's just that we're doing everything we possibly can to, <laughs> to induce it in our diet lifestyle. A lot of big institutions believe that cancer is a genetic mm. problem. Mm. Um, you believe otherwise? The evidence is striking. I mean, to believe, it's not whether you believe, it's what the data tell us. Okay, so according to the somatic mutation theory of cancer, mutations in the nucleus lead to dysregulated cell growth. That's the somatic mutation theory. In the mitochondrial metabolic theory, it's a transition from oxidative phosphorylation to, to a fermentation metabolism inside, inside the cell. Um, the mutations are largely irrelevant. What do you mean by that? When the mitochondria become defective, they throw out ROS, reactive oxygen species, that are carcinogenic and mutagenic. Whoa, what does that mean? Causing mutations. So a lot of the mutations that we see in the nucleus of the tumor cell, that is the subject of the somatic mutation theory, are downstream effects of the dysfunction of the mitochondria. So the mitochondria is causing a downstream effect, which are mutations, which, are, according to the somatic mutation theory, are the cause of the dysregulated cell growth. Let me tell you why that's absolutely untrue. There's some cancer cells growing out of control that have no mutations and normally not discussed. Well, how can that be? That's a, a challenge to the theory. If the theory says that all cancers have mutations and you have some cancers that have no mutations and they're growing out of control, that should say, oh, bell ring one. Uh, then they, the, the somatic mutation uh, people, people who think this, said, oh, oh okay, we have, a, we have a problem here. Not all mutations are the ones that cause the dysregulated, only some. And we have a name for those some. That's called driver mutation. Oh, okay, now it's a nice term. Because some of those mutations are called passengers. They don't really do anything. But the drivers are the ones that lead to the dysregulated cell growth. So we should be focusing our attention on these driver mutations. New evidence from the recent scientific literature. Can you believe this? They're taking tissue, normal tissues from patients, different organs and things like this, from not patients, from normal people, no cancer, perfectly healthy, like yourself here. We would take tissue from you and say, oh my Christ, look at the, you got driver mutations in your esophagus and your different parts of your body, you got driver, but you don't have a tumor. What's going on with that? How you explain that these driver mutations are causing dysregulated cell growth when we have thousands of driver mutations that are there that are not causing dysregulated cell growth? Oh, okay, that's a, another problem. The biggest devastating information against the somatic mutation theory is if you take the nucleus from a tumor cell, cleanly take it out of the tumor cell, and you have another normal cell here, you take the, nor the nucleus out of the normal cell and you put the tumor cell into that cytoplasm, you get regulated growth, no dysregulated growth. But if I have the normal cell 
and have a tumor cell, take the tumor nucleus out of there and take the normal nucleus and put it into the tumor cy cytoplasm, which contains mitochond defective mitochondria, dysregulated cell growth. This has been seen over and over and over again. So just to summarize that, so if you take the tumor nucleus out of the cell and put it into a, a normal healthy cell, yes, um, everything's fine. Everything is fine. But if you take healthy cell nucleus and put it into a tumor cell, yeah. you still have the same dysregulated cell growth, tumor, tumor growth. So, which means that it's not the nucleus. Absolutely. It's something else. It's something else. And that's the mitochondria. And I told you, then you have cancer cells with no mutations. And then you have driver mutations in normal cells that never become cancer. You put all those th things together and you have to be uh, a hopeless ideologue to think that cancer is a genetic disease. Um, it's a silent assumption in the field that cancer is a genetic, you know, every textbook of biology, cell biology, and bio cancer is a genetic disease. Why hasn't people's opinions changed despite the evidence that you present? It's a very difficult thing. It goes back to um, when you have one theory replacing another theory. It's called paradigm, paradigm shifts. And in, all in history of science, paradigm shifts have been met with great, great resistance. Uh, the, cl the clearest one was the Copernican revolution when uh, for eight, 1,800 years, astronomers in our, uh, uh, our early astronomers, astronomers thought the Earth was immovable in the center of the solar system. For 1,000, this was Claudius Ptolemy, uh, Aristotle, and the Bible, and all these, the Earth is immovable, and the sun and the moon and the planets all revolve around the Earth. 1,800 years. Even Copernicus uh, was working with these mathematical formulations as Kep was being constantly confused until he said, what happens if we put the sun in the center of the solar system and consider the Earth as simply another planet that would revolve? Oh, all of a sudden things started to make sense. And Giordano Bruno, uh, a, a theologian, was put to death for suggesting that Copernicus was right. Um, uh, there was a tremendous resistance on the part of the Roman Catholic Church at that time. And this is the same thing that happened when, when um, Louis Pasteur said the germs, the germs rather than bad air, are the cause of disease. So, uh, and when Darwin Wallace's theory of evolution came, it's not special creation, it's, it's natural selection that, that can explain this. These were massive paradigm changes in the history of science. And what we're seeing today is the same thing. The mitochondria is the center of the problem with cancer, not the nucleus. The mitochondria, it's a mitochondrial metabolic disease. And once you realize that, we're going to drop these death rates massively in a very in a number of years, for sure. So if we take two paths, then, if we realize that, that the mitochondria is the center of the dysfunction and ultimately disease in the cell, yes. if we go that, down that path, what impact do you think that will have on the cancer statistics over the coming years? It'll drop it massively. Okay, I'm not going to say we'll get rid of cancer completely, uh, but what, here's the thing. We may never get rid of it, but we can learn to live with it and keep it at bay if we know, how to, if we know that it can't survive without these two fuels. And you can do a diet and lifestyle that can restrict the availability of those two fuels and keep your mitochondria as healthy as you possibly can. What if we don't go down that path? What do you think? Then you're going to be right. One out of two people are going to be having cancer. Your statistics are going to be um, ab absolutely correct. If you love the Diary of a CEO brand and you watch this channel, please do me a huge favor, become part of the 15% of the viewers on this channel that have hit the subscribe button. It helps us tremendously and the bigger the channel gets, the bigger the guests.